muscles, and joints. Icy the doll, hot to relax. New Icy Hot Dry Spray. Just 20 happening now. In a proposed pandemic budget filled with cuts, the police department would actually get more money. How residents and council members reacted to that idea. We're looking behind the scenes at the work to get candidates on the November ballot to fill the 144th district court seat vacated due to the death of Judge Ray Olivari. And our old friend, the Heat High, is in charge of our weather. We'll be back to talk about temperatures, how hot it's going to be the next several days and through the weekend, see if there's any sign of rain, and a bit of African dust returns. All that coming right up. Shopping for a new laptop for back to school can be overwhelming if you're not a techie. Coming up, we have help and recommendations. And a big decision for the Judson ISD. The school board members there voting to determine whether to delay the start of the school year. The News at 5 starts right now. And first at five, activists may be calling to defund the police, but the city is not, at least not right now. In fact, the city's proposed $2.9 billion budget starting in October would actually give SAPD a bump. Today, the city presented its plan, which includes tens of millions in spending cuts with deal, to deal with revenue shortfalls from the pandemic. Garrett Berger tells us how residents and council members reacted. For months, activists and demonstrators have demanded changes in policing, including calls to defund police and use the money elsewhere. But the proposed budget city staff presented today doesn't quite do that. I can't help but feel as though this proposed budget is a slap in the face. The budget proposal would cut overtime for police and move 20 crisis response team workers over to Metro Health. But a scheduled 5% pay raise for officers would still put the SAPD's budget 8 million bucks over last year's. City Manager Eric Walsh says he wants to be deliberate about any changes to the department and proposed a process that would include looking at the SAPD's functions and possible alternatives. But that wouldn't finish up until next spring, leaving any resulting defunding to future budgets. But there's nothing deliberate about the same business as usual approach that made San Antonio the most economically segregated city in the nation. Numerous residents called in and hundreds left e-comments online, most in favor of reallocating money from police. City council member opinions varied between looking for larger changes. I appreciate the economic reality that has to be considered, but this doesn't seem to be enough of a shift. To keeping police funding intact. I could tell you from District 10, they want more policemen out on the streets. They want more safe officers. The mayor seemed to support Walsh's plan, saying real change requires time and a strategic approach. Uh, and I think it would be a disservice to the change that they're seeking to do it willy-nilly, just to try to... Um, uh, check a box. It's not a done deal. There are still virtual town halls, budget work sessions, a survey and budget hearings before the council passes a final budget in September. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. We have some new details on a deadly motorcycle crash in Kerr County. A 37 year old convenience store clerk has now turned herself in. Ronell Welch is accused of illegally selling alcohol to the 28 year old suspect, Ivan Robles Navajas. The Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission believes the suspect was already intoxicated when Welch sold alcohol to him. He ended up crashing into members of the Blue Line Motorcycle Club on Highway 16. Three people died at the scene. A fourth person died at the hospital. About eight others were injured. Welch is charged with sale to certain person and faces up to a year in jail and a $1,000 fine if she's convicted. She's been released on bond. Now to the latest on a murder arrest. 32-year-old James Walker has been charged in connection with the fatal stabbing of 49-year-old David Overstreet. Overstreet died at the hospital on July 31st after he was stabbed several times at a motel on Industry Park Drive. Police say that Walker confronted Overstreet, who had been arguing with Walker's sister in the motel room. At some point, Walker pulled out a knife, then stabbed Overstreet in the chest, neck, and arm, and then ran off. The warrant was issued for his arrest. He was taken into custody this morning. We've learned a man who was hit by a vehicle last night has died. The Bear County Medical Examiner working to identify the 33 year old victim. Police say he was crossing East Houston Street just before midnight when he was hit by a vehicle, a, a white vehicle. They, they say that driver did not stop and will face charges when they're located. And new at five, the Judson ISD board has voted to delay the start of school by about a week. Classes will resume August 24th instead of the 18th. 
They'll be remote until Labor Day. After that, the district will offer in-person instruction to students with, quote, extenuating circumstances. On September 28th, students will continue virtual learning or return to campus, depending on their parents' choice. The start date for teachers, Monday, August 10th. And they are facing a deadline that's just over two weeks away. The local Republican and Democratic parties busy trying to decide who they will put on the November ballot to run for the 144th District Court Judge seat. The bench has been vacant since last winter following the death of Judge Ray Olivari, a Democrat who died after a lengthy battle with cancer. Both parties are in the process of screening applicants in order to have their candidate's name registered before the August 24th deadline. We're going to allow them to speak at our CC meeting on the 11th and then on August the 12th, uh, we will have a special meeting in order to certify a candidate. We're a little bit behind them, but in the sense of timing, and that's just, you know, because we're just taking over as of a few days ago. The winner in November will serve the remainder of Judge Olivari's four year term and will be up for reelection in 2022. President Trump and Joe Biden divided on just about every issue during the campaign and even the campaign itself. From the pandemic response to mental fitness to the now presidential debates themselves, Whitney Wilde is at the White House to break down this debate over debates. Whitney. Exactly. Uh, a lot of it's very meta in some ways. So what we're looking at here is the Trump campaign saying, Looking at the schedule, we have a problem with the fact that debates are happening after millions of people could possibly get their ballot and could possibly vote. So right now they're advocating to add a fourth debate at the beginning of September. The Biden campaign saying, well, wait a second, the president hasn't even signed on formally to the other three debates. In a presidential campaign, there is never a shortage of things to debate. Donald Trump failed us. We're going to defeat Sleepy Joe Biden. Including the presidential debates themselves. Last fall, the Commission on Presidential Debates announced what has become customary, three general election presidential debates, with the first set to take place on September 29th. But on Wednesday, the Trump campaign sent a letter to the commission asking for a fourth debate, submitted a list of debate moderators that the Biden campaign says would be friendly to the president and requested an earlier start date. The one problem I have, the debate's very late. It's at the end of September, and a lot of ballots will already be cast by that time. They want to make the debates as late as possible. Echoing some in the right wing media, Trump is also alleging that Joe Biden won't debate him at all. My people are telling me that they're they're playing very cute. They're trying to get out. There's no question about that. But Biden says that's not true. I'm so forward looking to have an opportunity to sit with the president or stand with the president in debates. In fact, his campaign formally agreed to debates back in June, while the president has yet to officially sign on. In a statement, the campaign said in part, Joe Biden will appear on the dates that the commission selected and in the locations they chose. Donald Trump has not. The Biden campaign further alleging that the president's focus on the debates is an attempt to distract from his administration's response to the pandemic. All right, Whitney, I want to ask about another topic on people's minds tonight. There are signs that negotiations over the new stimulus packages are getting even messier. What can you tell us about that? Well, here's what's going on. The Democrats and Republicans are having a really difficult time just coming to a top line number. And chief of staff for the for the president, Mark Meadows, says, you know, when you can't even come to a top line number, he doesn't have a lot of faith that a deal is going to get done. And let's not forget, they started these negotiations a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, and they were trying to bridge a two trillion dollar gap. So trying to bridge an enormous divide in that short amount of time was already difficult. Not to mention the fact that Republicans have a lot of infighting because some Republican senators don't want to see any spending at all, noting they've already spent more than $3 trillion. Uh, there's about a little more than a trillion dollars that hasn't yet been spent. So it's very, very messy, very fractured, trying to hit a deadline of Friday to get it done. And we'll just have to wait and see if that happens. Back to you. Whitney Wild live at the White House. Thank you, Whitney. So what role will propaganda play in the November election, specifically what we see on our social media and in our news feeds? Well, tomorrow we're going to take those questions to an expert, a discussion with Trinity professor Aaron Delwich about computational propaganda, COVID-19 
and the assault on democracy. It takes place tomorrow at 2 p.m. We'd love to include your questions in this live stream. You can watch it on KSAT.com again tomorrow at 2. Could San Antonio be home to a permanent headquarters for the U.S. Space Command? Well, that's what Mayor Ron Nuremberg is requesting. The U.S. Space Command is in charge of war efforts in space. Operations are currently based in Colorado Springs, but the Air Force is looking for a permanent location. The mayor, Governor Abbott, and members of the San Antonio congressional delegation have recently written letters to Air Force leaders at the Pentagon requesting San Antonio be considered. Houston and Fort Worth have also been nominated by the governor. You can read the letters right now. They're on KSAT.com. That's a familiar sight outside. A lot of sunshine, just some Passing patchy fair weather clouds and really not a whole lot of them out there either. 99 degrees so far today. That's the high temperature. We could still hit 100. We'll officially know by 6 o'clock. The record today, 105 set back in 2013. You look at temperatures right now, and for the most part, we're in the upper 90s, right near 100. New Braunfels, 101. And as we go through the rest of the evening and even on into tomorrow morning, very similar conditions. It's what we'd have been experiencing the past couple of days. There's some African dust to talk about and the newest drought monitor coming right up. Thank you, Adam. Fear and concern over the coronavirus. It can lead to more stress for all of us. But during the pandemic, one child psychologist says that he is seeing a significant increase in mental health issues among children. Fear of getting sick, concerns over masks, unemployment, isolation, anxiety over all of it. This pandemic has been hard on everyone. It's a almost a perfect storm, if you will, of, of factors that really increase the stress. Ryan Madigan, a child psychologist and founder of the Boston Child Study Center, says during this pandemic, he's seeing a 40 percent rise in psychological problems in children. Children are, are sponges uh, and, and they pick up on far more than we realize. With school right around the corner, Madigan says it's especially important for parents to maintain a balance. Be vigilant about things like social distancing, masks, hand washing, but also explain that these things are being done to keep everyone safe. Uncertainty breeds uh, fear. Um, so the more uncertainty there is for the child about what's going on, the more anxiety is going to follow. Uh, Talking to your child about what they're feeling can also help ease the worry. If we can embody as a culture, uh, a, a way of sort of uh, listening, learning to listen to emotions rather than ignore, fight or dismiss them, uh, I think we'll all be uh, a lot healthier in the long run. The psychologist says that parents also need to make sure that they're taking care of their own mental health needs so that they're better able to be there for their children. With the new school year upon us, learning from home might mean you need a few upgrades like a new laptop from storage to screen size, which laptop is best suited for your student and what you might want to consider before you buy. Next. Well, as families gear up for an uncertain school year, a reminder the state sales tax holiday begins tomorrow. It continues through Sunday. Texans pay no sales tax on most clothing, shoes, and school supplies as long as the item costs less than $100. It applies to curbside pickup and online shopping as well if you're staying out of the stores. Back to school spending could hit record levels this year and not because of backpacks and pencils. Technology is in demand, especially laptops. 12 on your side's Marilyn, Moore, Marilyn Moritz with some Laptop 101. I feel frustrated. Sometimes I feel like crying. Erica McMaster is still reeling from how school ended for her five kids. At home, I have only one uh, one computer. I'm thinking of buying two more or three for my girls. Laptops top the back to school shopping for students kinder through college. Before you buy, check with your school for any requirements. For most school age kids, a Chromebook is fine. Uh, pretty much any Chromebook. Uh, and that's because uh, students are gonna be using web apps. Consumer Reports recommends the Google Pixelbook Go or this Lenovo Chromebook. Things to consider when picking a laptop, screen size, weight, battery life, speed, and memory or RAM. Four gigabytes is plenty for light users 
course, but for older students? Uh, eight gigabytes is a good place to start, but if kids are doing things, if they're using their laptops for gaming or they're running software for making music or art or things like that, something like 16 gigabytes is going to be a better option for things like that. College is a different story. It often depends on the course of study. Check with the college first. Consumer Report says it's hard to go wrong with a MacBook Air or, if you prefer Windows, the Lenovo Flex 15. To help concentration, headphones with a built-in microphone. CR recommends the Monoprice headphones for less than 50 bucks or these in-ear Panasonics. If now's not the time to spend money on a new laptop, there is free software that helps you turn an old laptop into a Chromebook. We have a link to instructions on our website. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Looking outside with Sky 12, there's the Alamo, looking bright and shiny. Or as bright and shiny as it could be, it's a little old. Looks great for its age. Yes, it's holding up well. <laughs> Got a pretty good roof for its age too, huh? And yeah, you know, exactly. this is just a typical August day for the Alamo. Yeah, you know, we got the heat out there, a lot of sunshine beating down on us, and that's what we expect this time of year. 99 so far, that's the high temperature today, and that's our current reading at the airport in San Antonio. The newest drought monitor is in. Remember, it's updated every Thursday. This is not it. This is last week's. I always like to show you the previous one before giving you the newest one. Now, one noticeable change is in Bear County. Okay, here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift this. Boom. We actually saw our abnormally dry area shrink in Bear County and even some surrounding areas as well. However, we do have the drought off to the west, especially Uvalde County southward, and this has extended a little bit more. We could use some more rainfall, obviously not just to alleviate the drought, but even for area lake levels. Here's a look at the latest readings from the uh, lakes. Medina Lake 58% full. That's 20 feet below the conservation pool. Canyon Lake 95% full. That's just two feet below and a uh, choke right now at 40%, which is 20 feet below the conservation pool. What's notable is the one year change. Medina is down almost 20 feet compared to what we had last year at this time. So where's the rain? Well, we have some in New Mexico, North Texas, Oklahoma. Unfortunately, it's not in our neck of the woods right now. We were very lucky and fortunate on Monday, but then ever since then, upper level high has settled in and it's just a little too close to allow any of these disturbances that are off to the north of us to make their way into our neighborhood. So unfortunately, the upper level high is blocking out those rain chances for now and then giving us the sunshine and temperatures right near 100. But watch how things change as we get into next week. I'm seeing signs of a pattern shift and that would put the upper level high, the big blue H, over the desert southwest, Arizona and New Mexico. That's good for us because just like on Monday, that gives us this northerly flow aloft. It opens the door for any potential disturbance to move into town and kickstart a few showers. Rain chances aren't high as a result of it, but we could see a few isolated pop-up showers, mainly some, maybe some widely separated activity toward the middle and end of next week. Notice how Saturday, Sunday, I have that 10%. That's mainly just along the coastal bend area and the coastal plain. But once we get toward the middle and end of next week with that little shift in the pattern, there's a little bit of hope for uh, for some of that uh, some rain chances here and there. Also want to talk about the Saharan dust, the Saharan air layer that's right now over the Cuba area. This is likely to push our way and give us just a little extra haze as we get into Sunday. OK, so not really going to be a thick dust plume, but you may notice a little extra haze on Sunday and that would be it. 99 right now, dew point is 66, so it feels like we're up to 103. Joanne's Backyard and Lakey at 95, Del Rio 102, Floresville, Seguin, both 99, along with Panna Maria, New Braunfels right now, triple digits along with Utopia at 100, Windcrest now at 98. So clear sky this evening, uneventful southeasterly breeze at 5 to 10. Then as we start the day tomorrow, we'll be in the 70s again, mid to upper 70s by the afternoon. We'll make it upper 90s to right near 100. And I think for the most part, we'll just be flirting with 100 through the weekend and into next week. Give or take a degree. What's a degree amongst friends, right? That's you're, right. You're giving us a break. Thank you.
All right, the Spurs lost a game, but they haven't necessarily lost ground, Greg. No, they haven't because Memphis is not doing well without their key player, Jaron Jackson Jr. At the same time, they may get a break tomorrow against Utah. When we come back, more about that. And the Greyhounds, if and Bernie, are favored to win their district. A preview coming up. Our San Antonio Spurs dropped their second game in a row when they fell to the Denver Nuggets in Orlando. The loss has dropped them into 10th place in the Western Conference, one game behind Portland Trailblazers. But thanks to the Memphis Grizzlies getting beat by the Utah Jazz, 124-115. They're still two games out of the eighth and final playoff spot. Jakob Pertl has been thrown into the fire as a lone big man in the four-guard lineup. And Patty Mills was asked about his performance against some of the best big men in the NBA, Joel Embiid and Nikola Jokic, in the last two games. This is the perfect situation for for Jakob and, and for the other guys too, is to be able to, um, you know, be thrown in the fire, so to speak, to be able to um, learn on the fly. Um, so, so this is what, you know, these few weeks was always going to be about was development um, and and meaningful things as well. Um, so I think it's great. I think Jakob is going to come out of these few weeks a much better player. And the Spurs may get a big break tomorrow because the Jazz will be down four players. They will not have Mike Conley. They will not have Rudy Gorbera, Donovan Mitchell, or Royce O'Neal. Most of those due to injuries. Our big game previews take us to Bernie, where the Greyhounds are favored to take district, according to Texas Football Magazine, playing in 14-4A Division One. Coach Shea Hendricks welcomes back 11 starters, six on offense, five on defense, of a team that went 7-4 and four overall, made it all the way to the area finals. Quarterback Rashawn Galloway will lead the offense after throwing for over 2,300 yards for 24 touchdowns. And on defense, Greyhounds welcome back linebacker Elijah Marshall, who had 83 tackles, two sacks, and two interceptions. It's very important, especially for the seniors. I mean, they got to go week to week, not knowing if they're going to get to play. We might have to forfeit any game. So me as a junior, it's very critical that I take it serious because these seniors may be the last time I ever stepped on the field, and I'm blessed to be able to be able to play another year. All the seniors are dreams since middle school has been to go state. That's what I'm hoping for this year. We have a strong senior class, and I feel like we're going to go for it. With everything that's going on with the pandemic, we weren't quite sure if we were going to have the season, but we've been really blessed to have the opportunity to play this game that we all love. You know, we feel good about our team, our chemistry, uh, the way we worked this summer. We had a great summer strength conditioning, so we're ultra excited, obviously, just to be playing. Um, kids have got a great attitude and obviously ultra, ultra excited to play. So um, we're ready. We're, uh, we're ready to roll. And the Greyhounds will kick out their season against Beville Jones in Bernie Friday, August the 28th at 730. You know, it's just not that far away. It's not. It's pretty close. I mean, what, two weeks from tomorrow? Pretty much. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Greg. Can yeah. you stand it? Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Right now, we're upper 90s, right near 100 across South Texas. And tomorrow, very similar. 77 in the morning and then right up near 100 in the afternoon. Maybe a few coastal showers Saturday, Sunday. Slight chance of rain toward the end of next week. Thank you, Adam. And thank you for watching the News at 5. World News up next.